This week on Q&A, journalist Robert Strauss. Mr. Strauss talks about his book, Worst President Ever, James Buchanan, The POTUS Rating Game, and the Legacy of the Least of the Lesser Presidents. Robert Strauss, author of Worst Period, President Period, Ever Period. I'll ask you that about that in a moment. I want to read your dedication. To my father, Samuel Strauss, who made me read every historical marker we've ever passed, thus assuring me of a lifetime of winning trivia contests, and my mother, Edna, for teaching me how to laugh, especially at myself. Explain the father connection. Well, my dad, and and, and vis-a-vis this book, you know, he saw when I was little that I would pick up the sports page and read every little statistic on it. And so he bought me this book called Facts About the Presidents. It's, it's still my favorite book in a certain way. And it was like Moneyball for Presidents. It would have every last line, however long they live, to the day after their inauguration, or you know, how, how long their mothers lived, where they came from. Anyway, so it became this sort of thing for me that I was the Moneyball guy for, for presidents as a little kid, and they'd show me off at parties. But then my father... Wherever we drive, there'd be some of these historical markers, right? And they still exist. And, you know, we'd have to stop and read it, whatever it was. Maybe sometimes he'd make me read it aloud. And, and of course, I played my kids the same way. So, so that, that, of course, gets you to uh, Jeopardy level, uh, you know, thin but long at the top. Well, while we're at it, what about mom teaching you how to laugh? Well, that's... That is, and that's really important because um, I, I don't think you can really be successful unless you can laugh at yourself. Uh, and um, my, my thought is, especially writing a book like this, you have to sort of take the opposite view. You have to sort of take the contrarian's view to say, not everybody was an amazing success. Not every biography has to be about Washington and Lincoln. There, the reason why I chose to do this, forget about whether I chose Buchanan, but why I chose to do this is I do think you can learn from failure. I think that if the next president wants to aspire to be like somebody, they probably want to aspire to be Washington or Lincoln. Well, you can't recreate the country and you can't have the Civil War. So what do you do next? Do you aspire to be James Monroe? I don't know. But what you can do is you can aspire not to be James Buchanan. What number of presidents was James Buchanan. What number? In, in order, he was the 15th. And before we go any farther, but where were you born? Where was I born? Yeah. I was born in Philly. And he was from Lancaster, about 60 miles away. When was the first time you went to his grave or his home? I did a story for the Philadelphia Inquirer weekend section on what you can do in Lancaster for, you know, if you went to the, there for the weekend. It's also part of the Amish country. Uh, and I took my daughter, who was in high school, so it's not that long ago, really. She's a, she's a senior in college now, so maybe five years ago. Well, you give a lot of credit in your book to a guy named Patrick Clark. Uh, there's a great quote in here about Patrick Clark and what he says about James Buchanan. What, what, who is he? Patrick Clark is sort of the keeper of the goods there. He's the guy who runs Wheatland uh, Buchanan's uh, home that he bought uh, when he was middle-aged and lived in the rest of his life. It's a beautiful home. If you go to Wheatland, just if you like historic homes with period furniture, it's great, too. But he was really helpful to me. Now, he knew I was not writing the most favorable biography of Buchanan. And you know, we spent hours together. And uh, what's funny about it is he sort of acknowledges that Buchanan's not the greatest president in the world. But you can, once again, he's of the mindset you can learn from anything. What's, what does he do? I mean, what's his job? On he, he runs Wheatland, the estate, and sort of the Buchanan uh, legacy. Who, who supports it? Uh, I believe it's a private foundation, it, but it's Lancaster uh, history. Uh, it, it's, all, it's all tied in there. Thaddeus Stevens also came from Lancaster, and, and there's other historic monuments in and around there. I want to dip into your book to, and have you tell the story of somebody. It has, this is a non sequitur, but this story was so unusual. Daniel Sickles. Oh, it's a great story. What's great about history, and of course you've interviewed many historians, is that we forget it. 
I mean, even even people who are relatively interested in high school or college who go through Washington, founded the country, Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, Lincoln Free the Slaves, you know, so you, get, you remember one thing of everything. But we forget that there's, you know, Years and years, years pass, and many things happen. Well, Daniel Sickles was a congressman from New York, but what he was prior to that, he was when Buchanan was uh, ambassador to England, he was his right hand man. Uh, just before they left, Sickles was in his early thirties. He married a fifteen year old woman in Washington, and got her pregnant, and then left to England. Going to England, he took a prostitute with him, a, a famous prostitute. Well, I don't know how famous prostitutes were, but but uh, uh, he even introduced her at court. Uh, anyway, they time passes. He comes back. He's gotten various jobs in the government here, and uh, he he uh, gets a letter from somebody saying that his wife is having an affair with Philip Key. Philip Key was Francis Scott Key's son. Everybody's related. You know, there's only 23 million people in this country and not very many of them are of the elite. Anyway, so Philip, Philip Key is also said to be the handsomest widower in, um, in Washington. Well, anyway, at some point he sees Philip Key uh, in the park near where he lives. That's a lot of park. It was another park nearby, but he runs to Lafayette Park. He runs after him to Lafayette Park. He starts running away, and he shoots him, kills him, right there in front of everybody, however many people were there. He runs to the house of the attorney general and surrenders. So they lock him up, but he's sort of freer than many people, and he gets to uh, 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 meet with dignitaries in the warden's lounge, and one of those dignitaries is the sitting president, James Buchanan. Now, who can imagine the president going to see somebody in jail like that? But he did. Anyway, uh, he, he secures as his defense attorney, Edward Stanton, who Edward Stanton, who eventually becomes secretary of war under Lincoln. Now he's going to the ages, is his great quote, when Lincoln dies. And he tries a new kind of defense called the insanity defense. He gets sickles off. Sickles gets taken from the courtroom on the shoulders of his friends. He has a, he re reconciles with his wife. He becomes a general at Gettysburg, uh, uh, ambassador to France, uh, has a, a distinguished career, lives till he's 90. And gets the Medal of Honor. Yes. In, world, in Civil War. Right. So he originally went to Great Britain as an aide to, to James Buchanan. Buchanan. Exactly. At what point was James Buchanan the ambassador, the minister to uh, Great Britain in his well, life? Well, here's, here's the thing about Buchanan. He's the most, in a certain sense, qualified man by virtue of a government resume to ever run for president. He was a, he was a, a state legislator in Pennsylvania. Then he was a, a, in the U.S. House. He was in the U.S. Senate. He was ambassador to uh, Britain under uh, Pierce. Prior to that, he was ambassador to Russia under Jackson. And he was secretary of state under Polk. So he had a long and, I don't know if we call it distinguished, but a long career in government service. Uh, uh, pretty unusual. And uh, uh, so he, he, he was ambassador to Britain at not a, a particularly crucial time, but, you know, he was that. Now, how did, what have you done in your life? I mean, what's, what was your career? My career, I, I, was, I went to a small school in Minnesota, Carleton College, a, major in philosophy, which was, a, uh, of course, great preparation to become a sports writer, which is what I did. I worked in newspapers, magazines, and television. Uh, and uh, at some point, I decided to freelance about 20 years ago when I teach uh, writing, uh, nonfiction writing at Penn, so, uh, but, but as an adjunct, not as a, uh, a full-time staffer. And it's all worked out pretty well. You were teaching when you discovered that a president had gone to the University of Pennsylvania. Who was that? Yeah, William Henry Harrison. I was teaching. I was teaching his class, and and uh, I was having fun. And I said, uh, "Well, you know, you guys aren't like Harvard and Yale. No presidents from Penn." This girl pipes up, says, "We had a president from Penn." I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, "William Henry Harrison." So I said, "Really?" So we look up, and so Harrison, uh, Harrison's father whose name was Benjamin Harrison, as was his grandson, who became president, 
uh, was a sire of the Declaration of Independence. So he'd been in Philly a lot, even though he was from Virginia. And he said, and uh, William Henry Harrison wants to become a soldier. And his father says, no, you're not. You're going to go study medicine with my friend, um, Benjamin Rush, up in Pennsylvania. Benjamin Rush started the first hospital in America, Pennsylvania Hospital. So he goes up, you know, reluctantly. He studies, starts studying medicine at what it's titularly Penn. And a month or two into that, his father dies. He says goodbye to Benjamin Rush and goes back to uh, Virginia and becomes a soldier. So he's a small, small case of the Penn uh, uh, president. You say, and, and you have this, as you just went through this uh, TikTok list in the beginning of uh, what James Buchanan has done in his life, that he ran for president how many times? He, he, he was a serious candidate for president three times prior to becoming the actual candidate in 1856. He had a, he had a pretty, you know, he was always at the top echelons, but never, you know, the, the cliche of the bridesmaid, never the bride. Uh, there was always somebody else who had the ear of the of the uh, uh, the bureaucracy or whatever you want to call it that runs the party. But eventually, in 1856, he's the last man left standing. And the 16th ballot in, in Cincinnati, he becomes the Democratic nominee in what I would say is about, well, the, 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 the recent elections hold no candle to the 1856 election, which is transformational in a way. Why? Okay, the, in 1853, we had a president from the Whig Party, Millard Fillmore. He, he, he succeeded uh, on the death of, uh, of uh, Zachary Taylor, but there was still a Whig Party. By 1854, it had broken apart. They lost the 1854 election incredibly to Franklin Pierce, and they just broke apart. And they essentially became two other parties, the, the uh, Know Nothing Party, and to think that we had an election where the people who were in it called itself the Know Nothing Party, sort of says a lot. And, and the Republican Party, uh, taken the name taken from the Democrat Republicans of uh, Jefferson's time. So the Know Nothings were, uh, uh, their big platform was anti-immigration, which of course sounds familiar today, uh, except that they were anti-Catholic immigration. They thought the Pope was going to come over here and, and uh, I don't know, take up uh, a seat on uh, on Capitol Street, and uh, uh, but they were against Irish and Germans taking our jobs. Uh, they didn't quite have a candidate, but they found one, and Millard Fillmore, who wanted badly back into the White House. Now, he never wrote a, a thing about being anti-immigration or anti-Catholic or anything, but he wanted to be back in the White House, so he took up their cause, so to speak. And then the Republican Party was mostly Northerners, well, it was entirely Northerners, who sort of, they didn't necessarily uh, believe that slavery, slavery should be abolished, but it shouldn't extend into the territories. And as you know, we, during those years preceding, we, we tripled the size of our country. So they were looking around for a candidate, and the obvious one was William Seward, who was a senator from New York, but he said sort of like, well, this is a new party. You know, he was a former Whig. I don't know. I'll wait my time out. This is not going to really work out this year. And so they picked a celebrity, John Fremont. Uh, and he was sort of nothing more than a celebrity. He had been a military governor in California for a little bit, but basically he was called the Pathfinder. He, w he and Kit Carson mapped out the West. They had four or five expeditions. And he wrote a uh, sort of dry journal about all this. But he had married the 17-year-old Bell of uh, Washington, uh, Jesse Benton, who was the daughter of the longest standing senator at that point, Thomas Benton, Democrat from Missouri. So she is sort of the uh, Chris Kardashian to his Bruce Jenner. She sees something in him. She's going to make him something. So she gussies up his journals. She takes them around to all of her father's friends in Washington, and it becomes what would today be a bestseller. And so he's suddenly a celebrity. And the Republicans say, well, we could hitch our ride to this guy. And so he's the man who runs for president of the Republican Party. The word that popped out at me that you ascribed to James Buchanan was obliviousness. Yeah. What, what were you getting at? Well, the, what, as 
you, you got to start somewhere when you're researching something. And so I started in the Library of Congress to, to uh, research this. And, uh, you know, so you, you mess around on the Internet and finally a page comes up and it's a letter from Buchanan to Lincoln. Presumably the only letter Buchanan ever wrote to Lincoln. Uh, but whether it's the only one, it's the most significant one to me because I love the goofiness of history. So it's a letter written in October of, um, of uh, 1861 after Lincoln had been in office a little bit. The Civil War had started, lots of fighting in, in Northern Virginia. Uh, on the particular day that the letter gets written, so maybe you kind of didn't know this, one of Lincoln's good friends from Illinois, who became a senator from, from Oregon, dies in battle. The only sitting congressman ever to die in battle. As, as most people know, studied Lincoln. Mrs. Lincoln was always prone to blue periods, probably was at this point. But even if she wasn't, he's all, he would be all prepared for this. A war is going on. He's a little busy. But this letter from Buchanan says that he forgot a few books in the White House. Could you get somebody to return them to me? And thing like, oh my God, you know, like, like, like he's not even thinking that. They're, and he that sent that letter to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, right? And this is <laughs> this is the last. This is like the first thing Lincoln should be worrying about on this particular day, you know. You talk about a party that uh, Buchanan had when he was being considered for the Supreme Court. Yeah, he he, you know, he he he, he always waffled. That was his big problem, that he waffled about everything. And he was waffling about this Supreme Court decision. But he's, a, he's known as the best partier in Washington. So he has a, a great party uh, with a celebrity chef uh, for everybody to come over. And he keeps giving so little parties to supplement it. But then in the end, he decides he doesn't want to be on the Supreme Court. So he's, in a certain sense, he's done all this for nothing. Where do you get the money to put on parties? He was a good lawyer. He was he was early on. He 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 was a star student at Dickinson. He got thrown out for a while. They let him back in Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, but he was always a top student, and he was always very uh, uh, sure of himself. And he goes to Lancaster because it was then the the uh, capital of Pennsylvania, the largest inland city in America, six thousand people. America's pretty small. So he becomes the best lawyer there. Even though the capital moves to Harrisburg, he decides to stay in Lancaster. He, he defends a lot of uh, uh, people of note, and, and he makes a good buck. You say he also is very generous with his nieces, nephews. He was. Did, did he, by the way, did he ever marry? He never married. There's, a, you know, there's, always, there's always the speculation of whether he was gay or not. But, uh, but early on, there's sort of an amazing story, too, that how did we not know this? Well, he he uh, he gets engaged to his f- friend's uh, wife's cousin, Ann Coleman. Her father was one of the richest men in America. He was an iron maker. Uh, he was an older man. Uh, this was his youngest daughter. Not excuse me, his next to the youngest daughter. But he, you know, he was very. Uh, uh, he looked after her very well. Uh, didn't sort of approve of this relationship that he, she was having with Buchanan, but. You know, he let it go. Uh, at some point, Buchanan comes home from Philadelphia, where he'd done some business, stops off at his friend's house. His friend's wife's cousin is there, apparently a beautiful woman. He's there for an hour or two. He goes off. Of course, gossip goes around Lancaster at this level. Ann Coleman uh, accuses him of who knows what he's, she's accusing him of, uh, breaks off the engagement, sends him a note, breaks off the engagement. Buchanan doesn't know quite what to do. He sort of stands back and says, well, if I let it go for a couple of weeks, it'll all blow over. In that interim time, uh, uh, she goes off with her younger sister to see her older sister in Philly. Uh, they, they get to Philadelphia. She doesn't feel well. The other two go out to the theater. By the time she come, they come back, she's in convulsions, and she dies. Presumably suicide. At least that's sort of the speculation, that she killed herself over this relationship not working out. So whether she killed herself or not, the idea that, that a, a guy who eventually runs for president uh, uh, has his fiance dying when he's young has to be sort of a big, a big story somewhere. Now, why did, and the cover of the book shows this, why did you name this book Worst Period, President Period, Ever Period? Well, of course, I have to bow to my, 
my editor, who was the one who thought of the title. It's it, it's sort of the way people, young people, punctuate their stuff now to to, to have these great pauses in the way they think they, they they talk. So if you said worst person ever fast, somehow it doesn't have the resonance of it. Worst, you know, sort of emphatic. And uh, um, I did really want to make a point about how we rate things, how we rate presidents, and how we rate things in general in, uh, in, in our discourse. How do we? We do everything. You know, we have, there are, the polling has become ubiquitous. People poll everything about everybody. I mean, you didn't have to, you didn't have to watch the last election closely to know that every day there was some new poll coming out. And, and, uh, uh, and we became interested in it, and that became the, the, the topic of the day. Who was ahead? How many points? This state, that state. You know, there, there are basketball polls and football polls. Basketball, I, I point out, you know, each week on Monday morning, there comes out two college basketball polls. And, you know, people, they move up and down, however the teams do, win or lose. But at the end of the season, there is a 68 team tournament that decides everything. You don't need these interim polls because in the end you're going to get the champion. But yet my kids uh, went to or, or graduated from Davidson College and they're sort of always on the fringe of the bottom and if they make it up to like 24th one day, I'll, I'll give a little cheer and I'll email my wife and my kids and, and I'll gloat over their uh, beating who knows George Washington or something. So it's, so we, we, we're, just, we're just insane about rating things, and presidents are no different. So let's pick five, you pick five, <clears throat> presidents that you could put on the bottom besides Buchanan. Okay, and, and, and in the book I do try to make a case for Buchanan against these people. So my, my next to worst, and I assure you I'm not going to write a book about him <laughs> as the second worst president, would be his predecessor, Franklin Pierce, who did virtually every stupid thing that Buchanan did. I shouldn't say stupid, but, but bad decisions. Except the Civil War did not start on his watch. He was able to forestall that. So even just for that one thing, he sort of rates ahead. Lots of people, of course, will pick uh, Herbert Hoover, who the Great Depression started under. But Hoover made great attempts to, to uh, ameliorate it. They weren't successful, but he, was, he had ideas and he was really trying to do something. Buchanan's uh, great fault was he, he he stepped back. At any time he was, should be stepping forward, he would step back. So Hoover at least tried to do things. He brought some good people into government. He, uh, he, did, he forestalled any, any uh, uh, hostilities. You know, I realized that uh, Mussolini and Hitler were sort of moving along the line as he was, as he was president, but, but he, he was able to see our way through Pierce, a uh, pe- peace, not Pierce. Uh, uh, another person that people pick a contemporary would be Jimmy Carter. I, I could never put Carter at the bottom of a list. First of all, he uh, he negotiated the only uh, uh, Middle East peace settlement that really still exists between Israel and Egypt. Uh, he he brought consciousness to uh, to uh, environmental situation. People left him wearing sweaters, but that was. You know, at least there was some sort of consciousness of that. Uh, he had a bad economy. He certainly screwed up in Iran, but, but, uh, and he had, you know, a marvelous post presidency. So I couldn't pick him. Richard Nixon. It depends on what you think. If you think that that having to resign in disgrace is worse than starting the Civil War, well, then I can't argue with you. But also, Nixon did a number of things that have lasted: uh, opening China, uh, starting the uh, EPA. Um, so, so he has his good qualities too, and I guess the fifth. Uh, if I've already done five, uh, this is the sixth. But if it's the fifth, Warren Harding, people talk about. But one of the things about Warren Harding is he came to the presidency wanting to continue the business, uh, uh, the, the the good business cycle that had started, and he was able to do it. He they were scandals in, in his administration. He had an illegitimate child. But and he died in office. But still, he did what he said he was going to do, which is at least something. So, how did you decide to write this book then about the worst president in history in your mind? Okay. Well, part of it is this whole thing of my my father imbuing me the presidents, and I'm thinking about him. And and uh, 
I play early morning basketball in Philadelphia. I, I park at 5.30 or 6 in the morning on a certain street corner, and it's a, a notorious street corner in Philadelphia, and we'll get into why, but, but it is. And, but on the corners, this Pennsylvania Historical Society, where many of James Buchanan's papers are, and think, hmm, you know, James Buchanan. I hadn't really thought all that much about him, but, but uh, then I went and sort of studied the papers, and I see, like, really, like, he made this decision, that decision. They're all bad decisions. And I thought... Who says so? Oh, of course, me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but they were decisions that led to the Civil War, uh, in a sense. I mean, there was a, there was a clear pathway uh, of, uh, of, of sort of almost, they were almost non-decisions in some ways. Why are the papers where you found them? What, what, why are they uh, his located? nephew left many of his papers there. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, one, of, one of his, uh, he, he, he was very, like, as you said, very kind to his nieces and nephews. And, and his nephew took charge of many of his papers. And when he died, he left them to the... Had you written books before? I'd written, I'd, well, I'm a journalist. I've written a lot of stories. My, uh, uh, but I, I had written one book before, and it was a memoir about being the dad of girl athletes. But it wasn't like my kids were the greatest. It was sort of funny and sentimental. And so it was a completely different kind of thing than this. Uh, you say that James Buchanan did not profit financially. No, he, he well, because he, he, he was, uh, in his mind, independently wealthy. He was not the wealthiest man in America, but, but his desires were to give parties. He loved giving parties. There's always a positive aspect to every negative um, uh, guy. And uh, he was, uh, two things about him is, one, in all of his papers, and I read a lot of stuff by him, about him, to him, he never says anything bad about anybody publicly. At least, in, at least in papers, I don't know what he said, you know, in, in verbal terms. But he, even people he didn't like politically, he never said anything bad about them personally. And like I said, he loved giving parties, and he was the the inaugural ball of 1857 was the greatest party in 19th century America. How did you find that? Okay, well, here's the problem. After Van Buren, the next several presidents had non-partying aspects to them. Washington wasn't a very big town, but there was still an elite party scene. There would have been. Dolly Madison was certainly invited to every party. Um, so after Van Buren, William Henry Harrison dies after a month in office. His successor, John Tyler, has a sickly wife. She dies while he's in office. Not much partying going on there. Polk comes in. His wife's a strict Presbyterian. No drinking or dancing in the White House. Not much partying going on there. Next president, Zachary Taylor, he dies in office. Millard Fillmore comes into office. His wife is sickly. She dies soon after his term is over. But, she, but you know, there's no first lady to partying going on. She really wants to recede in the background. And the most tragic of all is Franklin Pierce. Two, he was said to be the handsomest president. He was, a, he was sort of the John Kennedy of his time. Young president picked out of nowhere. Uh, from New Hampshire. His, uh, his wife doesn't want him to leave New Hampshire, but yet he runs and wins. Uh, he has uh, two sons who die young. And then he has a third son, is, of course, his now favorite son. As he's sort of taking his victory lap after winning on a train, he's in Massachusetts. The train has an accident. His son dies in front of him and his wife. So the third son dies, but really, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Pierce wears black. Through the whole time of his presidency, she barely ever appears in public. So we have this whole long time of no parties in Washington. Suddenly, the great party of James Buchanan's the president. He gives this fantastic inaugural ball. He puts up a, they put up a huge tent on Lafayette Square. 6,000 people come. Now, 6,000 people is a lot in a country that only has 23 million people. And uh, and Star Spangled, a big orchestra, food that you can't imagine, saddles of this and oysters like that. And uh, uh, Harriet Lane, his niece, is the first lady. And she is the Jackie Kennedy of her time. She's every, everything she wears, all the young women want to wear. Uh, they have trading cards that are Harriet Lane trading cards. Uh, they name a Coast Guard cutter after her, the USS. 
uh, Harriet Lane. It, it eventually fires the first shot of the Civil War from the Union side. It gets captured by the Confederates. They don't rename it. She's too popular. It's still the, you, it's still the CSA or whatever they would have, CSS uh, Harriet Lane. So, uh, so these two together are just looked upon. He, he starts out in such a favorable way. Uh, all the dignitaries come. The, the story, the, the recounting of it in the New York Times and other papers uh, are just wonderful. They're just a wonderful, wonderfully written story about the pomp and, and everything that, that had been gone from Washington. But then the Dred Scott decision comes down. Before we get there, okay. <clears throat> why is Harriet Lane known as the first first lady? Okay, it, they sort of called Dolly Madison that. Uh, the first lady, because she was so prominent in society, both while she was first lady, while she was the, the, the president's wife, and then afterwards, and you know, after, after Madison's death, she was the go-to person. Every party Dolly had to be at. Um, but then Harriet Lane is the hostess in the White House, so what are you going to call her? She's not the president's wife, she's the president's niece, so they called her the first lady. So if you go back over, as you suggest, James Buchanan's life, he was a state senator or rep in Pennsylvania? He was a state rep, right? State house. Okay. He had a law degree. He goes on to be a congressman to the U.S. Congress from Pennsylvania. Right. He becomes a senator right. from there. He becomes the minister to Russia, the minister to Great Britain. Um, and secretary of state. Secretary, and se <laughs> secretary of state. And then becomes president. Is he... At that point, the most qualified person to be president. Uh, if you, if that's what you go by, yes. If you go by the number of years at a major post, and depending on what you call major posts, he definitely is. Um, but here's something about him: he's never proposed any significant legislation, or he never got any significant legislation passed. He was a conciliatory man. He was. That's why he was probably. Uh, he was, he was extremely good in Russia. Uh, Andrew Jackson sent him to Russia and is said to have said on his deathbed that he would have sent him further if he could. He, he didn't particularly like Buchanan, but he was sort of the Don Corleone of presidents. He was micromanaged everybody and made sure that everybody would, uh, would cleave to him. So, so uh, Buchanan comes to office with a long resume. He was sort of boring to people. He was 65 when he was elected. Uh, nobody until Reagan uh, was that old after him. The, the, the Democrats had had quite a streak in the White House after the first two Federalists. They won 10 of the next 13 elections. He was a Democrat. He was a Democrat. You know, pretty good, 10 of 13. If your ball team is, wins 10 of 13, you're pretty happy. Um, so he comes to office. It's a crucial time, but it doesn't seem any more crucial than Pierce's term or Fillmore's term. Slavery is the overhanging problem. What is the first day that he is president? Okay. He, he, he becomes president in March, in March as, as they did then instead of January. The but, year. The year. Oh, oh in, in 1857. And so, so he sees as his mandate to solve the slavery question. It's not get rid of slavery. It's to solve the slavery question. He, he was called a doe face, which was a southern leaning northerner. They said you could, uh, you know, massage their face like dough. And, uh, but he lived in Washington. Washington was a southern city. I mean, he was a bachelor. He, he went back to Pennsylvania. But most of the time, he's in Washington. Uh, his friends were Southerners because more Southerners than Northerners actually took up residence in Washington. Uh, uh, the, the railroads got the uh, Northerners back a lot easier. Uh, so he's predisposed to think like his friends. Um, Anyway, so he wants to solve the slavery problem to, to keep the union together. And he sees this court case going around. It's called the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott was a, a slave to a uh, military man in Missouri who for a time went to what is now Minnesota, uh, free territory, and then came back to Missouri. He dies. Dred Scott sues saying, I was free in Minnesota. I should be free. Uh, like I say, the court case goes around. Um, and it comes up that it could be on the Supreme Court's docket. But Roger Tawney, the 
Supreme Court Chief Justice, who, like Buchanan, went to Dickinson College, so they had some sort of bond. Uh, but you say he did not own slaves. Tawny. Buchanan did not. Tawney did. Tawney did own slaves. Did own slaves. Many? I don't know how many, but enough, okay. you know, whether you, what you call many, but, but he had slaves his whole life. He was from Maryland, and he was Francis Scott Key's uh, brother-in-law, to show that everybody's sort of connected. Uh, so anyway, so they have this discussion before uh, Buchanan takes office and says, we can't just have a decision that's Southern-Northern. The, the, the court was split five Southerners and four Northerners. It's not going to amount to much. You... Uh, so Buchanan takes it upon himself to find a northern justice that will go along with this. And he finds a guy named Robert Story, who, coincidentally enough, went to Dickinson College. So they have this bond once again, and Story says, okay, I'll go along with whatever Tawney does. And uh, uh, another uh, northerner from New York says that I'll write a concurring opinion. So it's essentially seven to two. Now you can have a, a decision that might mean something. Northerners going along with southerners. Uh, the decision comes out two days after the inauguration. It's said that on the uh, uh, inaugural platform, before Tony gives his, uh, him the oath that they discuss something, uh, Buchanan had distributed uh, souvenir uh, uh, transcripts of his uh, inaugural address. There are a few lines that weren't in it, and a few lines sort of allude to this decision's gonna come out, we're gonna all be happy about it. But the Dred Scott decision, is generally thought of as the worst decision uh, that the Supreme Court has ever made. There, there are contenders for that, too. But in any case, it essentially says that every state is a slave state. It says that Dred Scott can't sue in court. He's not a free man. He therefore can't sue. In fact, he's still a slave. And in fact, slavery can't be outlawed by individual states. It, it reinstitutes uh, the, the, the most heinous parts of the Fugitive Slave Law, it negates all the compromises from before, all the ones you remember from high school, the Missouri Compromise, Compromise 1850, and essentially uh, makes the, the United States a slave country. But right away, you say there's something called the Panic of 1857. Right. So what this causes, we've had a 20-year expansion. Things have been going great. Countries opening up, Louisiana Purchase, uh, Oregon Territory. Uh, Texas, all these other lands that we're getting. People have a, the American dream going on. You, can, you, know, you don't make it in Pennsylvania, you go up to Ohio, go up to Illinois, go up to Missouri, wherever. You can make it. Railroads finance this, essentially. People speculate on different railroads. Uh, uh, but suddenly this decision comes out, and let's say you've got a tin cup factory in Cincinnati. Going pretty well. Maybe I'll open one in Dayton. Uh-oh. Maybe this guy's going to come up with Kentucky, from Kentucky with his slaves and be my competitor. So I don't do anything. I stop, I stop expanding. The country immediately stops expanding. People who have speculated on railroads, railroads aren't doing so well immediately. Uh, they go bankrupt. They, uh, you know, take a ride on the Reading, like in, uh, in uh, the Monopoly game. Reading uh, Railroad stops running. Uh, the other businesses fail. So within months, we're in this tremendous economic panic, a greater precipitous depression than the Great Depression. Uh, all the banks in New York close for a day. Uh, they decide not to take scrip. Well, you don't have sort of gold scraping it off of that to pay your employees at the tin cup factory. But in the South, it doesn't affect them that much, as much, because they're an agricultural society. You can feed and clothe your, your family, at, at the very least. You can probably sell your, your cotton and your, uh, your lima beans. But in the North, where manufacturing has gotten sway, it's really precipitous. So that divides the country ever more. Well, how would it compare Panic of 1857 with our problem in this country in 2007? Because it was so, because, because the, the money class was so much smaller, and they were affected so much, so greatly, so quickly. So, the, so our most recent recession, I'm not belittling it, was not as like this. It was not a, was not a, a dive off of a cliff. It was, it was sort of a, a, a slower, uh, a, a, a things, things happened uh, in, in, in a matter of course, as opposed to just precipitously. I'll, I'll give you one example. I like to tell stories within this that, that have something to do with me. But I, I'm, I'm out looking 
for a 25th anniversary present for my wife. You know, and I'm trying to think of goofy things. So I go to this coin store, thinking I'll get a quarter, 25th, right, quarter. Or I'll get some, you know, uh, silver dollar from when we were married. But I, I'm waiting for my turn, and I look in the case, and, and as people who look at coins know that the coins were yay big when in the, 18, in the 19th century. So I'm looking at these coins, and, and then suddenly in 1857, the coins are like this, like a dime. So I asked the guy, he says, oh, Panic of 1857, that was Buchanan's great uh, idea. We'll make the coins smaller. Well, that's about his idea, because the rest of his idea is like, you know, to heck with you, you speculated, you deserve it. Why don't you be like the people in the South who work hard with their hands? So he does nothing to ameliorate it. He just figures it's going to play itself out. And uh, sure enough, it does, because eventually we have a lot of munitions to make in 1861. You say that um, Americans have a lot of vitriol uh, toward their presidents. Yeah, I think so. I, 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 I don't know how you feel or people out there feel, but they probably don't hate their mayor or congressman. They might not agree with them in this, uh, you know, like something like that. But uh, especially as the last election shows, they're, you know, they're, the, 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 uh, if, if you can only go by polls, how, how much uh, uh, the, the two main candidates were disliked as opposed to liked. Um, and I don't think that's any different from times in the past. We tend to have, it must be because they're the top person, that, you know, whatever it's jealousy or we feel they have the ultimate say over us and we can't possibly agree with everything they say and somehow we really find, uh, like I say, vitriol. I know you wrote about James Buchanan, but if you had to say the four or five most interesting presidents that you've looked at, studied, gone to their sites over your years, who would, the, who would they be? Interesting, I, not successful, right, but interesting. Right, right, right. You know, it's funny. I, I, I did write a story for the New York Times once on visiting uh, uh, sites of uh, lesser-known presidents. Of course, I knew the Buchanan book was coming, so I put him at the top of the story. But uh, I found that as I looked into the lesser-known presidents, I was sort of more interested in them. Uh, um, Mike Coolidge, he was an interesting character. He was really, you know, this whole silent cow thing. One of the things in my little statistical book was he had three hobbies. One was pitching hay, one was riding a mechanical horse, and one was throwing Indian clubs. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, yes, like who, who knew that you threw Indian clubs? But in any case, uh, uh, they're like bowling pins. So, so, uh, so I always found these, these sorts of people uh, interesting. I, I, I badgered my wife to stop at presidential sites. We, she, uh, we, we live in New Jersey, and we drive out to her mother's house in, in Michigan. And on the Ohio Turnpike, we would pass this sign constantly, Rutherford B. Hayes' house. Say one day I'm going to go there. One day I'm going to go there. Finally, we're driving out last year, and I say, "Can we please go there?" And she looks at me and she says, "90 minutes." <laughs> you know, I got 90 minutes to, to cover a brother for B. Hayes. We go to his house. It's a beautiful old house, 30 some rooms. His his father had died, and his uh, uncle was rich, and 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 built this house for his mom and him. And uh, anyway, we're going through it, and of course, there's only two other people on the tour. Uh, uh, you know, it's not presidential history is fine, but most people stick with Monticello and Mount Vernon. And so, at the end of the tour, uh, the the woman says, uh, "Would you like to see Hayes's bellows-driven harpsichord?" You know, like Indian clubs. What's a bellows-driven harpsichord? So I say, "Of course." And she brings it out, and sort of this, as you might imagine, it's driven by a bellows at the bottom. And she says, "Would you like to play it?" And it was like. Well, yeah, and Mozart's violin, too. So for me, that's, like, wonderful. So I go, and I pump this thing at the bottom, and I play Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And I'm just imagining Hayes sitting there saying, yeah, let's go, let's play two, you know. What are some of the other presidents that, uh, you, you know, you'd put on the list if you're going to be a visitor? Uh, I, I would say, well, of course, the great ones. You know, you would, you know I, I don't care how different their politics are than yours. But come on, you know, you know, George Bush has the same birthday as me, the younger George Bush. I'm waiting for him to invite me to his birthday party. I mean... Uh, uh, same uh, age? No, he's five years older than me. 
exactly. Merv Griffin also had the same birthday, so unfortunately he's not around. But if he were, we could play Jeopardy together because that's what Merv invented. But uh, but I, I would like to meet all of them. I I I, I did it one, I once did a story with uh, David Eisenhower, Ike's uh, grandson, who's writing books about his grandfather's time. He, he was a Pulitzer finalist for one of them. So uh, the Penn Alumni Magazine, Penn, uh, he teaches at Penn, David, calls me up and says, will you write a story with him? And I'm right, I'm thinking like, God, you know Eisenhower, he's sort of not all that well thought of in, in sort of the scheme of presidents. But, so he starts telling me stories about him. And, and, and once he starts telling me stories, he, I said, well, well, David's father, the middle generation, was Ike's chief of staff, and they eventually retired to Gettysburg. So David is, uh, I don't know, young teenager, less than teenager, and Ike would come to his Little League games. Now, can you imagine that, the president coming to his grandson's Little League games? He wouldn't, want, wouldn't you want to sit with Ike and talk baseball? And I said, that must have been a lot of pressure. And David said, oh, no, I'll tell you what pressure is. He says, you know, my grandfather loved to play golf. And so that was the one time he would allow the press to come and take pictures is on the tee when he would invite some general or, you know, diplomat or something to go. And he's, and often there would only be two other guys. So he'd say, David, come on, you got to come out and play. says, that's pressure. All the nation's cameras are on me, a 14-year-old trying to make a good drive. So, you know, the more you know about these people, you know that they were substantial people, even if they, I mean, I, I always, have, I've always have, 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 have admonished people who always want to say uh, how dumb George Bush was or something. They're like, wait a second, this is a guy who went to Yale and Harvard Business School. You might not agree with his politics, but he's not dumb. And, and uh, so I, I would, I'd love to have dinner with any of them. What could our new president learn from studying Pat, uh, Pat. <laughs> Pat Buchanan? That too, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but from studying uh, James Buchanan. <clears throat> okay, he could... Uh, I, I think the differentiation of good presidents and bad presidents, you know, Washington, Lincoln, and FDR are always at the top of the, the surveys that historians take. They were decisive men. You can't come to the top of the ladder and not be decisive. Buchanan was a waffler. James Polk hated him for being a waffler as Secretary of State. He always went back and forth on decisions. You're my advisor. You've got to tell me what to do. So that's how he was as president. I could go on the list of things that make him the worst president, and all of them have to do with not making a decision when he had to make a decision. So that's what the next presidents, whether it's this president or, or, uh, or, or succeeding presidents, should learn. He, he, some point, you've got to say, this is the way it's going to be. I mean, people who didn't like Reagan don't understand the re reason why people liked him is because he made decisions, whatever they were. Uh, so go at that point, go through a couple of decisions he did not make that led to the Civil War. Okay. So, there's a, so the, the next upcoming state is going to be Kansas. Kansas has a problem. Is it going to be free, come in free, or slave? So the, the, the slave contingent comes over from Missouri, makes a capital in Lecompton, a small town, uh, gins up a, a, a constitution that allows slavery. So non-slave people come to Topeka, they have a similar constitutional convention, just the opposite, of course. Um, there, about, there, uh, there were six slaves in all of Kansas at the time. It's not like it was going to be slave territory, but the South needed another slave state. They needed somebody on their side. So, of course, they're supporting it, especially people in Missouri. Something's got to happen. Buchanan's got to say something. He's got to choose one or the other. He's got to have a something he's got to say there's got to be an election there's got to be something that's going to resolve this problem because before it becomes a problem but then of course he doesn't he makes no decision he sends several people out there to be governors of kansas he doesn't listen to any of them saying this very thing there are not that many soldiers in the united states there's only about twelve thousand troops one of the things that happens in this in this uh, uh maelstrom is people start firing each other john brown who becomes much famous later, more famous later, uh, he, he's uh, said to have murdered several slave owners and their families. Uh, now it's called Bloody Kansas, but still Buchanan makes no decision. Brown sort of gets away, 
it's not like he, he was doing things in secret. He meets with Harriet Tubman and and uh, and uh, uh, Frederick Douglass and other uh, uh, anti-slavery people. Eventually, he comes to uh, Harper's Ferry in 1859. Well, in 1850, Harper's Ferry you go to now it's a bucolic setting. Appalachian Trail goes through it. It looks like a Disney version of a, a 19th century village. But back then, it was a big munitions uh, maker. Uh, other industry. It was 40 miles down the road from Washington. Uh, Brown comes there not so foolish. If he can get some of these munitions, gather some more people on his cause, maybe he can have this slave rebellion that he wants. For two days, Buchanan does nothing. Nothing. He, he says, oh, let them handle it in Virginia. It was part of Virginia, not West Virginia then. Until this prominent scion, uh, Robert E. Lee, comes home from his post in Texas to Arlington. And he goes to Buchanan and says, you know, I think we ought to do something. He says, all right, take, take some troops out there, see what you can do. Well, of course, uh, uh, Lee does capture uh, uh, Brown. They have sort of a show trial. Uh, he eventually gets hanged. But by this time, he is a martyr. Uh, Victor Hugo's writing about him. Ralph Waldo Emerson and his crew are writing about him. Walt Whitman's writing about him. Uh, now... Uh, and, of course, that angers both sides, uh, exacerbating any problem there is because of his inaction. When the Corcoran Art Gallery shut down here in Washington, <clears throat> they had to get rid of a, a lot of paintings. You say in your book that the National Gallery of Art refused to take the Buchanan painting, yes, done by well, George Healy. Yeah, well, here's the, here's the problem, of course. One of, one of the great things about Harriet Lane is that into her dotage, she was the go-to woman for every party in Washington, too. She endowed, when two of her sons die, she endows the Johns Hopkins Children's Lab, uh, uh, you know, Children's Research Lab, which is still in her name. Uh, and she has this art collection, some of which is Buchanan art, and she gives it to start a National Gallery of Art. She essentially started the National Gallery of Art, and one of, of course, her favorite paintings was this portrait of her uncle, <laughs> and ironically enough, when they disperse the art, you know, you know, this particular portrait of the founder's uh, uncle, who's president, doesn't make it in the cut. Do you have any idea why? Probably wasn't a very good painting. <laughs> but uh, but, but it, it went into sort of a portrait section of a lesser gallery. So, so when you, you dedicate the book to your father and mother, and for your father for making you read all the roadside right. historical signs, what, when you think, is your father alive? No, he's not. When you think back about your dad in those early days, how old were you in those early days when you first started fooling around with history, and what do you remember uh, an incident or two with your father? Well, it's, 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 uh, I was about five or six, but we, we didn't travel much. It's just, what did he do? Oh, he's a lawyer. He was a local lawyer in Camden, New Jersey. And, uh, uh, but he was still fascinated with history. We have, I still have like, books and books and books, like President Polk's letters or all these sort of things. So they were always around. But we did take one trip to the South when I was 10. It was 1961. And, uh, and we started going to uh, uh, Civil War sites because that was the start of the Civil War centennial. But we made it to uh, Stanton, Virginia, where Woodrow Wilson's birthplace is. And we come up to the door, and there's a sign that's closed. And my father, you know, we never traveled there, looks around, and it was the day the second Mrs. Wilson died. Like, how unlucky could we possibly be? But you mean the anniversary of Edith Galt, uh, Wilson's death? No, it was the day she died. Oh, that's right. She, she, lived, she, lived, she lived a she, long oh, time. Right. right, yeah. Okay, so, so it's like, who could pick that day? But anyway, so he, says, he revs it up, and he says... Ah, eh, we're going to go to Charlottesville, not very far away. But we don't go to Monticello first, or Ashlawn, where, where uh, uh, James Monroe lived. We go to the library at the University of Virginia. He storms up the stairs. He was a chubby, small guy. And my mother waits in the lobby because she's already rolling her eyes. And I go up with him. He's got this sort of bo old box camera. And he comes up to the library, and I don't think there's anybody there, as I remember. And he says, I'm Judge Strauss from New Jersey. And I'm friends with Judge, you know, he makes up a name in Virginia. And he says, I want to, I need to photograph Thomas Jefferson's will. <laughs> All right. So the guy's saying, no, 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 you can't do that. We can't bring it down. Finally, my father's berating this guy, mentioning this judge in Virginia. 
uh, who I'm sure is apocryphal. And he finally gets he finally gets the guy to go to cowering back and brings out the pages of Jefferson's will, and he photographs them, and uh, he frames them in three frames. And I know it's three frames because when he died, I definitely had him have them in my office. So I have this framed Jeffersonian will in in my office. So so that's sort of how yeah that's sort of how I'm imbued, and that's why I want to tell sort of fun stories of history. So go back to your and the <clears throat> Rutherford B. Hayes home, and your wife says ninety minutes. Right. Over time, you've been married how long now? Uh, 1989, so 27 years. So over time, what's her attitude been about your obsession with presidents? She sort of doesn't mind it because uh, she had a fellowship at Stanford, and we drove across the country. And, of course, uh, Herbert Hoover is well-known at Stanford. There's a Hoover institution, and, and he went there. But on the way, we go through Iowa, and we go through West Branch, Iowa, and we stop at Herbert Hoover's childhood farm. And... You know, we run to the chicken coop and we look at the cats. And so, you know, she finds her, her, you know, side enjoyments in my, you know, bizarre nature of looking at history. How many kids? We have two kids. Uh, Ellen Sylvia Ellis, 25. Sylvia's 21. Both went to Davidson, where for only a short time, as it says in the historical marker, when you go there, Woodrow Wilson attended Davidson for one year. What do your kids think of all this? history stuff. Well, you know, they, they would pretend not to be like me, but I know that that um, uh, Sylvia, the younger one, uh, especially, sort of loves the nuances of history, and Ella studied history, although mostly uh, Indian, Indian meaning the country of India, history. So they, they sort of look upon it the same way I do. About out of time, but what are the chances uh, I can get you to write a, a a book on Dan Sickles. <laughs> Dan Sickles. I know. Lynn Miranda. It's got to, instead of Hamilton, he's got to have Sickles, don't you think? Who's your favorite character? Last question in this whole book. Oh, well, I think it's got to be Harriet Lane, uh, the, the niece of the president that I never knew about that was this doyen, the, the most, one of the most popular women in Washington for half a century. Uh, she, she would be the other uh, you know, musical. Robert Strauss, our guest. The book is called Worst President Ever, The POTUS Rating Game, The Legacy of the Least of the Lesser Residents, Presidents, excuse me, James Buchanan, among them on the cover there. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. If you enjoyed this week's Q&A interview with Robert Strauss, here are some other programs you might like. A. Scott Berg on his biography of President Woodrow Wilson. Evan Thomas talks about his book, Being Nixon, A Man Divided. And Scott Miller on his investigation into the assassination of President William McKinley. Watch these anytime or search our entire video library at cspan.org.